Shalom Aleichem, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. We're delighted to come together again <clears throat> to learn Torah in honor of uh, Avram Shmuel and Arye Leib, our good friend Alex Klein, friend and family here. And uh, we are learning, we are continuing to learn Torah, and specifically within Torah, Gemara. And within Gemara, what's referred to as Ein Yaakov, put together by Rabbi Yaakov Ibn Chaviv over 500 years ago, and has been the mainstay of Torah, Jewish Torah study for a few hundred years. It got a little lost after the Holocaust, but, uh, but it's coming back, it's coming back. It, uh, Ein Yaakov captures the values of Judaism and the premius of Yiddishkeit the neshama of Yiddishkeit, if you will. Where we were holding, we were learning Masech the Sachim. And uh, if someone doesn't have uh, in Enyakiv, they could open up uh, Sepharia. And it's on page 16, folio 16b, in the tractate of Pesachim. And it's actually an interesting question about why he brings this in to Enyakiv. It's a little bit more halachic. But there's one line that he felt crucial the, the Baal Ha'in Yaakov, and therefore he put it in. And I think there's a very powerful lesson um, for all of us on this evening. So, what we're looking at is a very interesting episode in, uh, in the prophet of Haggai. There's a prophet who could easily get lost because there's, there's the Tzayasa, the 12 prophets. And each one of them has a small prophecy, a few chapters, and it's very precious because how much prophet prophecy that we have from each prophet, not too much. And within that, Chagai is very, very small. You flip through the book, you barely, you could skip it, you can miss it in a second. Chagai is, act, is actually two chapters long, altogether 38 verses from Hashem, 38 verses from God Almighty, the word of God, the Bar Hashem. And this episode is six of those, of those uh, uh, 38 psukim, and the Gemara spends a whole... If you were in the regular Gemara, a whole page and a half discussing this, uh, what happened here and what took place. So the story is found in the second chapter of Chagai, starting from verse 10. And it describes the following, that on Chof Dalid Kislev, which means the 24th day of Kislev, the month of Kislev, which is referred to in the prophet as the ninth month of the year, the word of God. The word of God came to Chagai saying, So says Hashem Tzvois, the Lord of hosts. Ask of the Koyanim Torah, teaching. What's happening here is the following. The Jews are coming back for the rebuilding of the second commonwealth, for the second temple in Jerusalem. We were in Jerusalem the first time. We were in Israel for over 800 years. Out of those, eight, right, I think 880 years altogether until the destruction of the temple. A long period of time. And the last 410 of those 880 years, the te first temple stood. It was destroyed by the Babylonians. The Jews end up in Iraq, in Persia. Uh, the world empire ends up going over to Persia. We get permission from Cyrus. Um, some say it was the son of Queen Esther. Purim is coming up. And this takes place actually under the reign of Darius, Daryavesh, as he's referred to in Tanakh. And the Jews have permission. They're going back to rebuild the base of Migdash. The problem is, even just 70 years in exile had an unbelievable effect, a traumatic effect on the Jewish people. In terms, you have to realize, for a, Jew, for a nation which has never been expelled from its land, it was a, it's, it's an experience that I never had before. Could it even survive this trauma? The 10 tribes, as a matter of fact, as far as we know from basic history, it seems that they were lost. Maybe some of them mixed into the rest of us, but they were exiled first before the, 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 the second kingdom, the kingdom of Judea was exiled. So now they're coming back to rebuild the base Hamikdash. Hashem tells Chagai, I want you to test the Kehanim, their knowledge in Torah. A mivchan, I want you to give them a test. Are they up for the task? Are they, are they, um, do they have, do they have tayda? Do they know? Give them a test. 
It's multiple choice. See what they say. And what was the test regarding the laws of the base Hamikdash? Purity, impurity, etc. So now, he continues and he says, if a man will take Besar Kodesh, and this is what he quotes here in the uh, in the in the Kitiv, it says in the pasuk. He asked them what happens if a person takes something which is impure, which which on the garment on the corner of his garment, and he touches to a piece of bread. And then the piece of bread touches a stew, and then the stew touches wine. And then the wine touches oil. Has it officially become? Um, does it become impure or not? And they answered, it does not. Now, what's this dependent upon? So, for those who know the laws of purity and impurity, and I'm assuming some of you do not, there are layers of impurity in Judaism. When you touch certain things, you become impure, contaminated. Nowadays, the laws of purity and impurity are not relevant for the simple reason that it's a very spiritual thing and you need to have a very high spiritual antenna for it to be relevant. Even now, for someone who's extremely pure, even a small impurity could be a distraction, could be a disturbance, could be a little, cause a little bit of a problem in the, uh, it caused some static in the in the thing that's why for example even nowadays there's a custom of men who want to be more who want to feel some spirituality and sensitivity to go to the mikvah to go to the mikvah even though they're not obligated there's no mitzvah nowadays ever for a man to go to the mikvah women still have the biblical commandment of going to mikvah but men it doesn't exist it doesn't exist the uh the there was a discussion that maybe women should also have the concept of purity. After they're married, women are going to the mikvah always until menopause, and then they go to the mikvah for the last time, whenever they need to, and then they're pure. The, uh, the, uh, there was a thought that for the sake of purity, to keep it up, that women, that the, the Paiskim discusses over a thousand years ago, it's discussed. It's even quoted in the, the original Paiskim in the 12th century, 13th century. There was a big discussion that women should go to the mikvah. But the rabbis decided specifically against it, and they said not to allow a single girl to go to the mikvah for a simple reason that they don't want men uh, being with women and uh, out of wedlock. And if uh, if they went to the mikvah, it wouldn't be a big deal. But now, if a woman doesn't go to the mikvah, it's one of the worst sins in the Torah to to be with a woman who doesn't uh, go to the mikvah. So that's going to be deterrent for 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 people. But sp- there's a certain spirituality that comes from purity. So now in the times of the temple, this is re- very relevant when you eat holy meats, when you go into holy places. Now there's many degrees of impurity. The highest level of impurity is a dead body. It's referred to as avi avois hatumma, which means the grandfather of tumma. Everything, but other sources of impurity beneath that are called na'av hatumma, a father of, of impurity, like a sheretz, a dead carcass of, of, of many uh, different animals. Um, okay, so now if that's this dead carcass touches something, it now becomes it's called a rishen letoma. Number one, if number one touches number two, it could be a sheni. Sheni could touch a shlishi, could touch a revi, could touch a chamishi. There's no such thing as beyond chamishi. Chamishi is the level of impurity that's able to reach and make impure the sprinkling water which is used to purify the Jewish people, the may parda. The you may, have heard, you may have heard of it, the red heifer. It's the, it's the most pure thing found in Judaism. The thing that can purify all impurities, even the highest impurity, which is the impurity of death itself. Death is the opposite of life. Death is therefore uh, the, a total concealment on godliness because God is alive and God is the essence of life and anything connected to God should live forever. And the whole concept of death is a distraction and a distortion of the truth. And it's going to be restored when Mashiach comes, the truth that anything connected with God lives forever. But the concept of death is very unnatural. 
which is why even though everyone we know and we've ever known in the history of the world has died, in, we never make peace with it. And it every single time feels completely and totally unnatural and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem to, to, that it should be that way. And, it could, and people are actually very much in touch with the truth when they have that feeling because that, that's the way it is. So the ultimate impurity is death. That's why when Moshe Rabbeinu heard that a person becomes impure from a dead body, it says his face came ashen. And he says, how could a person be purified from this? And Hashem said it's with the red heifer, the para aduma. So that could reach, that is such a, it's such a sensitive, such a purity and such a truth that even the degree number five could, could make it impure. Anything else doesn't reach five. There's no, it can't carry that far. Kodidesh can sanctify things in the temple, could reach till Revi. Revi, four. Um, Truma, if I'm remembering correctly now, to remember a, a little bit of Girsa, the Yankis, like they call it, the learning from your youth. Um, a Truma, which is the tithing we give to a Koyin, which is also sanctified, could reach Shlishi. Um, then Shani is a debate. But let's say everything can reach Shani or just mice or Shani. Fine. So that's the discussion. The, that is the test that he's given the Kehan. And when they come back to the base, Hamikdash. this touches, this touches, this touches, this depends how you learn it. Bottom line, he seems to be giving a scenario of Rivi. Because if you look close, people say like this. The actual sheretz, the actual source of impurity, this carcass, is being held by the garment. And it's touching the bread, which is touching, which means it's an avhatum of the father of, of impurity, which is touching the bread, making it a rishay, number one, which is now touching the nozid, the stew, that's number two. Bel hayayin, which is touching the wine, which is shlishi. And then to the oil or anything else. That's what he says. Bel hashem and or any food. So what did the Kehanim answer? They said, by Yemru Lai, it does not become impure, which seems to be the wrong halacha, because Kodesh becomes impure. The Gemara records over here, and the Enyaki brings it down. Like I said before, people question why the Enyaki brought down this Gemara, but we'll see a powerful lesson. The, the, so Rav said, an argument here between Rav and Shmuel. Rav says, Ishtabush Kehane. The Kehana made a mistake. They were wrong. They, they, they failed. They flunked the exam. They, they, they got it wrong because they said you don't become, it doesn't become impure. Shmuel says they did not uh, fail. They got it correct. The Gemara says, Rav says they failed because he asked them, they were asked about Revi, the fourth level by Kodesh, and they said it's Tar. Shmuel says, no, you're misreading the story, the Pasuk. He asked them about Chamishi, number five, not number four, which they were correct. The Gemara goes on to ask, what do you mean? If I count it, it sounds like it's Revi. The Gemara says, Shmuel's going to argue to you and he'll say that the, you're reading the original one wrong. Because it says, Venaga Bichnafe, right? It says, Venaga Bichnafe. It should have said, Venaga Knafe, not Bichnafe. His garment, which is holding the carcass, touches. It said, with the garment. It's, he says, the way it's written, it could be that something which became impure from the garment. Maybe even his learning, by the way, I didn't see this. Maybe he's learning that the carcass touched the garment, and the garment is touching something. That's how he wants to touch it. And therefore, there's an extra layer. There's an extra level here, which is Hamishi. And Hamishi doesn't become impure. By Kodesh. Fine. What's the next Pasuk? What's the next Pasuk? The next Pasuk is Chagai asked them, and this time they get it right. He says, What if a dead a person who's tummy from an end uh, from an impure from a dead body, Tzmei Nefesh touches them. They says, Vayim Ruyitma. They said he's impure. And then what does Chagai tell them? Verse 14, chapter 2, verse 14. Vayan Chagai Vayoymer Kein Ha'am Hazeh V'chein Ha'goyaz. And of course, this is ultimately the purpose of the test from God, to give this prophecy and then to tell them to get their act together. He tells them, you should know that so too is this nation and so too is this people before me, says the, says the Lord, says God and all of the works of their hand, 
and that which they will sacrifice in the temple. You know it's impure. Exactly what you answered is how I view your actions and what's happening here in the temple and what's going to happen here in the temple. Very harsh, right? We're starting, the prophets are not letting up. The second temple is being rebuilt. It seems to be a happy time. Chagai comes in full force. Famous question. The prophets, God seems to be very critical. We'll touch upon it in a moment. And he tells them, the next passage, take to heart from this day forward, before you put any stone against the stone, before you build the temple, take it to heart, take Judaism seriously, and stop playing games and not knowing the halacha and not being meticulous to keep the halacha and, uh, and so on. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the story. Now, where's it, how's, the, how's it come down in the Gemara? The Gemara says, and the rest, the Enyaka doesn't really quote, he just says the Gemara is very long here, but I'll give you the, 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 the synopsis. Um, that, oh, so the, 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 the question the Gemara goes on further is that the next question of the Pasuk, the next Pasuk, the Kayanim for sure get it right, according to all opinions, because they say you're impure, and so on. So um, the, the, if they had enough knowledge to know the second answer, why should I assume they didn't know the first answer? A whole discussion in the Gemara. What's, what's really the logical distinction, and why would they say this answer? Yeah, this answer not. What was the, what was the, the, what was the thinking process of the Kehanim? And it's actually a fascinating Gemara, and there's a big thesis on it, and uh, a lot to discuss. The Gemara concludes... With Chagi's words, so is this people and so is this nation before me. So is all the work of their hands. What they offer there will be tummy. Now the Gemara asks, what does this seem to imply? Surely it seems to imply that they got the answer wrong. In other words, the opinion of Shmuel, right? The, uh, that, um, I'm sorry, the opinion of Rav, according to, uh, uh, according to the opinion that they got it right, why are you cursing them out? You guys don't know anything. You guys are ignoramuses. You guys aren't careful about learning the halachas. I can't believe what's happening here. They got it right. When I answers that no, even according to his opinion, this criticism was still necessary. He was telling them the following. Omer Rav Zutra Rav Ashi. Rav Zutra says, and some people say it's Rav Ashi. Rav Ashi is the author of the Gemara. The ultimate author, the editor-in-chief. He was telling them that since they corrupted their deeds, then even if they bring a correct sacrifice, it's treated as if it's in a state of impurity. In other words, you know, the, the, it's, you, you, it looks like you win or lose whatever they say. If they get it wrong, then how could they get it wrong? They don't, they don't, they don't pay attention. They don't care for the word of God, for the law of, of the Ebeshter. And if they get it right... Also, what do you think? It's enough if it's enough just to do the halacha? And you're allowed to do sins on the side and then you do this and you think it gets forgiven? No, that's not how it works in Yiddishkeit. It's not a game. It's not like you get to do some things and then some things you say, God, I know that you'll forgive me for this. That's not how it works. It's an absolute relationship. Absolute. There's no, uh, there's no separation of church and state. There's no, uh, there's no part of your life which is exempt from the laws of, the, of Hashem. That's what seems to be happening here. What, what, what's the answer of the Gemara in the end? What's the, what's the story? So Rashi is an argument here between Rashi and the Radak. Rashi says that actually at the time they were fine. They were doing a good job. Rashi, in the Gemara, Rashi says. Rashi says, He was prophesizing about what's going to be the future in the temple. That they're going to end up acting terribly. They're going to corrupt their ways with other sins. And he's telling them, I see where this is going. I see where this is going, and I'm seeing apparently the seeds of corruption now, and you have to nip a problem in its bud. A big problem people don't realize. You leave it to fester. He's telling them, I know it's good. Don't tell me it's, I know it's good. But I'm telling you, I'm seeing it all because a prophet sees it ahead. Sees, sees ahead. Let me give you an example. There's something called the seven Noahide laws. The seven laws of Noah that every non-Jew Every civilization is obligated to follow these laws meticulously. 
What happens if they don't follow it? So it's not like the laws for the Jewish people. It's a different kind of laws. The laws for the Jewish people are uh, godly, are here to bring godliness into the world. They're a whole different story. The mitzvahs of non-Jews are primarily, there's still a connection with God because God commanded them, but they're primarily created, the mitzvahs are given as a function of the world. That if not, Hashem says and declares for a fact that if any of these principles are removed, the civilization itself will collapse. The world cannot survive without these. These are the principles of civilization. If you follow these meticulously, the world's going to be a beautiful place. It's going to be a garden of Eden. It's going to be a wonderful place. The moment you don't follow it, everything will crumble. So people say, let me experiment. Let me remove one of the mitzvahs. Ah, let's see what happens. Who cares? Big deal. Now, here's the problem. They might even be right that within the immediate future, you don't see a crumbling of civilization. You don't see it but you've removed the foundation. Sooner or later, it's impossible, physically impossible for, the, for, it, for it not to collapse. It's gonna collapse. It might take a hundred years, it's gonna collapse. You've removed the substance, you've removed the foundation. Person says homosexuality, big deal. Nowadays we're open-minded, everyone does what they want. It's one of the seven Ohio laws. You think God just gave a commandment? That's not, that's, not what the, that's not the nature of the seven Noahide laws. To Jews, Hashem gives commandments, which are truly what we call chukim, divine, and those are also have uh, meaning in our lives. But uh, Jews have a different kind of relationship with God. All or nothing, you know, the whole nine yards like we were discussing a moment ago. It's like a, every fiber of your being, every bone in your body, a marriage. You're not a little bit completely devoted to Hashem. So every element of our life is, is, is guided by God. But what's the seven Noahide laws? That's not the nature of the seven Noahide laws. The seven Noahide laws doesn't infringe on every issue in Anandu's life. These are the laws that Hashem says that if you don't follow these, civilization itself shall crumble. So a person says, you know what? I don't, I don't feel that way. It doesn't matter whether you feel that way. It just happens to be a reality. This is what's going to happen. If you don't want to, you know what they say? They say that... Uh, you have free choice. You know, no one's going to deny free choice, but you're not free from the consequence of those choices that you make. People could do what they want. Is it going to work out? Love Dafka. Love Dafka. So now, oh, so it's the same thing over here. The Navi is coming to the Yid and he's to the Jewish people, and he's telling them you should know that there's, there's something rotten here, there's something wrong here. And you have to take care of the issue. You have to, you have to bring Mashiach. By the way, they had potential at the beginning of the second temple to turn it into the third temple, to make it, the, to make it Mashiach. So now, what specifically, what specifically was, 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 he, uh, was he criticizing? What did he want them to fix? What was his solution? So I saw two things, and this is what I think the takeaway for us is. What's, you know, we have to, we're reading a story about Chagai at the beginning of the second base Amigdash, the Gemara gets into a discussion. What's the relevance to our lives? What's the meaning? So I saw two things. First of all, one of them is in the Shalah HaKadosh, and one of them is from a big, the big Rebbe from, uh, from, uh, from 200 years ago, passed away in 1802. Let's start with the uh, with the with Shalah Kaddish. The Shalah Kaddish says that the root of all evil is um, is Azus Metach, is Gaiva, is ego, is ego. You have to see ego as the essence of evil. Everything else is simply an outgrowth of that core evil. Don't look at the symptom. Look at the look at the look at the uh, at the root cause. This is the essence. This is what you're fighting against. Don't fight against the sin. That's you're too late. You're miles late. You have to get rid of the feeling of yeshus of gaiva of uh, of self of inflated of his self importance. It's the opposite of Yiddishkeit. It's the opposite of what a Jew is. And if you can't deal with it, and if you don't find ways to deal with it, and, uh, you know, and until today, this is, the, this is, in many ways, the Hasidic masters, hundreds of years later, said that the whole Hasidus came for this point, to really bring down a person's ego. Don't take yourself so seriously. 
take your life seriously, take Hashem seriously. Don't take yourself seriously. There's nothing to take serious. There's nothing. The people have this inflated idea about life, about themselves, which is totally, it's, it's, a, it's a Madison Avenue hype. Like chametz, you put in one thing, you take out something completely different. That's not what I put into the oven. It's not what it is. It's just a blown up story. See, he says like this. He says the following. The, uh, the, the, it's a little bit, uh, the way he comes at it is interesting. He, he says, he says like this, the tzitz that the Kohen Gadol wore, you know, that band over his head said Kodesh Lashem on it. He says the tzitz forgives the sin of audacity and, and haughtiness. Azos Metzach. That's what it says in the Gemara, Tractate of Zvachim. He says, Rabbi Maxim, the, the public ask a question on this Gemara. They don't understand. There's a Gemara, there's, a, there's an explicit verse in the Parshish Tetzava coming up soon, which says that what, that what does his tzitz, what's it, Mechaper? The sin of bringing a sacrifice in a state of impurity. That's what it's mechaper. So which one is it? It's a direct contradiction. Does it forgive you for the sin of Azus Matzach or for the sin of bringing sacrifices in a state of impurity? So he says, the answer is Pasha. The answer is simple. He says, what makes a sacrifice be considered impure? Be considered impure if the people are sinning. A person can't come to the temple. No. You have to deal with your problem. That's really what a sacrifice is. A sacrifice is supposed to represent the human being. You burn the animal, which represents your ego. It represents the animal within you. Everyone has a different kind of animal. That's why some have an ox. Some have a goat. Some have a sheep. A goat is very stubborn. A sheep is too docile. It follows everything. A goat stays in its place. An ox is, 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 is a goring animal. Everyone has their Yetzirah, has their ego, their expression. It has to be burnt on the Mizbeah. You have to take the blood and spritz it on the altar. The blood represents the passion. You, you burn the fats. The fats represent the pleasure. You have to burn it on the temple in the fire of Hashem, the love of God, for the love of God. So now you bring a sacrifice, and it says that if you don't let go of, of that in any which way, you're still a, a sinner, basically. If a Jew brings a sacrifice and doesn't do tshuva, it's ineffective. In fact, it's impure. What did we learn in our Gemara? Because they corrupted their actions. Hashem considers their sacrifices as being impure. So says the Shalom HaKadosh, says the Holy Shalom. He says, sacrifices being brought in a state of impurity is, is uh, um, comes... Uh, being brought in impurity comes, Hashem consider, even if it was pure, Hashem still considers it impure. It's cons it comes from kilkulum Isayam, from sinning. Where does sinning come from, says the Shalah? Where's the sinning come from? He says it's a Befetish Gemara, it's an explicit Gemara, the tractate of Tainus. It says, call me Anyone who feels haughty and arrogant is going to sin. This is the root, that he, this is his source that he wants to bring, that this is the root of sin. And therefore, therefore, he says it all matches very well. When the Gemara says that the tzitz of the Kohen Gadol forgives for the sin of haughtiness, it's the same thing as the Pasuk is saying, that it sins for the, for the impurity of the altar, of the, of the, of the temple, of the, of the sacrifices. Because that we're trying to deal with this root cause and then automatically the sacrifices which are brought are considered are pure if you didn't follow completely it's okay the the bottom line i'll say that in in a, in a very short in a very short version is that an argument it comes out that even if you bring pure sacrifices before god it's considered impure if you sin the pasuk seems to say that the tzitz, even if you brought it in a state of impurity, Hashem forgives it and, and makes it pure. What's the distinction? So says the Gemara in the tractate of Zvachim, because the tzitz deals with the issue of arrogance, which is why, by the way, the Kayan God was the highest Jew of the, of the Jewish people. And this is the crown on his head. And what does it say? Kaidesh Lashem, dedicated to God. 
that a Jew, there is no pride, there is no ego. We've discussed it before in a previous class or maybe two classes ago, how uh, this was the big question and the big problem that all the rabbis had in the, 100 years ago with, 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 a, with a Zionism as it was being presented then, that they saw it as a form of nationalism. And they said that nationalism is the very definition of the opposite of what Judaism is trying to do, which is that we're proud of Hashem. We're not proud of ourselves. And if there's any arrogance, that is the root cause of all evil in this world. So that, so, so that, so Kodesh Lashem, it's all the Abish, it's all Hashem. So that is one perspective that Chagi was already telling the Jewish people, and he was saying, I understand you're religious. I understand you guys are very good. And according to Shmuel, they got all, they got all the answers right in the test. You're very smart boys. But let's talk tachlis. Let's be honest. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. I, I'm seeing a prophecy that this is all going to go down the drain. This is all going to disappear. This is not going to work. This project is doomed for failure. There's something which has to be dealt with. And you can't be complacent. You have to recognize the issue. How are you going to get a sense of selflessness, of egolessness, of sensitivity, and, uh, and he gave the prophecy, um, he gave the prophecy that he gave. So that's one perspective, very, very important, very, very central to, uh, to our lives about what to focus on. And, uh, and, uh, and there's many ways uh, to do that, to deal with it. One of them, of course, is learning chassidus, particularly because when you learn about the divine, when you learn about God and the unity of God and the nature of the world, it brings a sense of real awe to a person. It makes them realize the, the infiniteness of, of, of Hashem and, and the vastness of the world and the greatness of the Jewish souls and, and of all and, and of the creation versus when a person only studies the tangible and the physical and they don't, anything esoteric, their mind shuts down. And I know many people like that. And I understand the instinct. I understand where it's coming from. But it, it, the person is trapping themselves into a very square box. They're trapping themselves within their perspective and how I want to take things. And how you're not, a person's not open. A person has to be a little more round, not square. We have to be opened ourselves up to truths, to realities, not as long, otherwise we're just stuck. And, 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 and it's hard for us to escape our egos. How are we going to escape, you know, I say, I feel, I want? Who asked you? Why is it here what you want? It's a, very, it's a very profound element of Yiddishkeit that we let go. Is it possible to truly let go of the eye? Of the eye. Okay. Point number one. Point number two. And this is, this is so I saw this being quoted. I saw a speech given by Rebbe Hanan Wasserman, one of the greatest rabbis before World War II. He might have even been, been killed in the Holocaust. I believe he was killed in the Holocaust. Rebbe Hanan Wasserman, a big Rosh Hashiva, very famous. Um, the, the Malbim before him already says this Piddish on the Pasuk. But then I saw, I'm doing research, 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 and what do I see? I don't know why people are quoting them in their name. The, really, the one who said it originally was a Chassidish Rebbe, was a Rebbe. Um, uh, his name was Reb Tzvi Hirsch from Nadvurna. He was actually a student. He met the Baal Shem Tev. He was a student of the Baal Shem Tev, and he might have even heard it from the Baal Shem Tev. And afterwards, he became a chassid of, uh, of Reb Michle Zlachever, and then he was a rabbi. He said, they say like this, they say what's really happening here is a very fascinating, um, uh, what's very fascinating, the question, and we have to think about the answer. It's actually a fantastic question. What's happening, what Chagai is presenting the Kahanim with is the following uh, uh, scenario, the following question. He tells them like this, Pasuk Yudbeis, the, the, the pasuk which is quoted in the in the beginning of the Gemara, he says, "Hey, if I take something holy, besar kodesh, not not impure, which is the way it was being read before, something holy, and I touch it to different items, holy items or not holy items, does it make it holy?" And Rulay, they told him, "Of course, it doesn't make it holy. You take something holy and touch it to something else which is not holy, doesn't make it holy." Then he asked the next pasuk the reverse. If you take something impure and you touch it to these things that I mentioned above, 
would it become impure? I gave him Yitzma. They said it would become impure. And then he tells them, this is the lesson I want you to learn. You have to understand this is the nature. This is how it is with this people and with the nation before me and the works of their hand. The question being addressed is a, is a, is a question and it requires explanation. What's the question? It's a fascinating law, if you think about it. You touch with your pinky, something impure touches something pure, it's over. It's over. It becomes, the whole thing becomes impure. You have to burn it, whatever it may be. The smallest contamination, the smallest contact, we mentioned before, even le levels of contact. You ruined it, so to speak. Shouldn't it be the reverse? You should think holiness is so powerful. It's so strong. It's so true. That it, it should touch something and make it pure. Historically, even in Avedah Sashem, when people are trying to really connect with the divine and be real Jews and, and become more sensitive, there's always a feeling, and, and it might be a problem if you think about it, this problem, this is the quandary being presented, that people, they worked hard for so long, and then they do one sin or they do something wrong, and they feel like they lost everything that they've been doing. They feel like they're, lo they're losing it, or they lost it. Versus, uh, it should be the reverse. A person sins, 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 sins. One mitzvah phew, transforms everything into goodness. What's happening here? He asked them this question. Halachically, you touch this, it comes holy. You touch the reverse, it becomes impure. And I told him, you have to realize, and then what's the lesson he's learning from that? What's his prophecy that he's learning from this to the Jewish people? On Chav Dalet Kislev. He told the prophecy that he's learning from that is that um, you have to realize that this is, this is the issue we're dealing with, that you can't, you can't think that there's such a thing that you're partially going to do tshuva or this. No, he says you gotta, you got to root out any source of impurity. That would seem to be the message. That would seem to be the message. He should, he's telling them that you should know that anything holy doesn't come easy. It has to be internalized. It has to be real. It has to become one with you. Impurity, just touching it already, it's very easy to, 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 to catch up, to become part of you. It's, it's interesting that Abba Khan Vasiman uses this vart. He wants to say in his speech, take it or leave it, this, but this, I'm just repeating what he says, that there can't be a bridge, he says, you can't create a bridge between Judaism and the Jewish people, uh, between the religious, to religious and and uh, and nationalism. Lu'umiyut, to use his words, he says there's no bridge to be had. He says people. He says there are people who want to be in the bridge. They want to be in the middle. He says it's impossible to be in the middle. Why? Because he says, look at the halacha. Look at this person. You touch something impure, you become impure. <laughs> but touching something holy doesn't make you holy. So he says if you're the bridge between holy and impurity. Guess what happens to you? You become impure, he says. Because holiness, the Titus says, it's not enough to touch it. You have to be completely immersed. You have to become one with it. But touching something unholy does make you impure. You're going to already become impure. So now, it is, so like I said before, it's a very good question why it is that way. And what does it mean? Now, of course, it has for shalom. God forbid to suggest and minimize the power of a mitzvah. The reverse is also said. It's brought down that all negativity is like a, uh, it's a bubble, or it's like, uh, it's like darkness. It's really the absence of light. And therefore, even a small candle pushes away so much darkness, and it dissipates. It doesn't just drive it away. It doesn't have to fight it even. It just, it melts away. The darkness melts away. Because the, a mitzvah, a candle, the light, the fire of Hashem is truth. And that overcomes and overpowers everything. And you see how much the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, for example, focused on that even one mitzvah, right? You see a Jew who's covered from tattoos from head to toe. You meet him in the street. He hasn't done a single mitzvah in 40 years. And you say, put on tefillin with me. And you say that this is the ultimate moment in the world. This is infinity itself. This is infinite value. This is more powerful than anything else that ever happened. So the Pshat, 
L'chayda, what we're saying is like this. The mitzvah itself, is never, we're never minimizing the power of the mitzvah. A mitzvah truly is infinite. In other words, what do we mean infinite? We mean very simple, that God is the one who wants it. God is infinite. That means every mitzvah is infinite. And it's not that we doing a number of mitzvahs makes it worth more. The person says, oh, if this Jew puts on tefillin 20 years in a row, that's valuable. 20 years worth. If it takes 20 years to be valuable, that means each one is a finite value. And you're adding up, and altogether, it's very nice. That's not what a mitzvah is. A mitzvah is God, God Almighty himself commanded to do a mitzvah. There can't be, if one thing doesn't have infinite value, then 20,000 things of it doesn't make it infinite value. It's like the Pasuk we read in the, on a fast day, we say that a person who can't have children shouldn't say, hey, nani eitz yavesh, I'm a dried out piece of wood. What worth do I have? Hashem says, no, I'm going to give you a, a place. You're before me if you keep Shabbos, he says, and so on. You're more precious to me as better than sons and daughters. What's the Pasuk saying? The Pasuk saying a very profound idea. The Pasuk saying that where does the buck? The buck has to stop somewhere. So let's say the purpose of life is to have children. And then your children's purpose is for them to have children, et cetera, for, you know, ad infinitum. Where does, where is someone actually living for the sake of living, for the purpose itself? So some people think the purpose of living is take care of themselves. We don't mean in a bad way. We mean, but there has to be ultimate purpose, ultimate meaning, infinity itself. And Yiddish guy does believe that. That's what it's saying there, that when you connect with Hashem, it's, uh, it's worth more than anything. So the, the, so as far as the mitzvah is concerned, absolutely. What we're referring to is as far as the corruption of the human being. In other words, not a, uh, the, uh, the historian Beryl Wine famously says, he says, never confuse Jews with Judaism. Two different things. Judaism is absolute truth. Yidin are trying their best. So now it's the same thing. In terms of the discussion between the Navi and the future of the Jews in the, in, the, in the temple and to us, the lesson to us is that it's very nice. It's true. Every mitzvah is infinitely valuable and we have to know that. And we have to know that in our core, we have this relationship with God and God wants us to do the mitzvah. So he wants to have a relationship with us and we should tap into that relationship. However, in terms of having a revealed, tangible, sensed, open relationship with God, a human on the human level, on our hearts, in our minds, in our psyche, in our feeling, in our sensitivity, which God wants that as well, by the way. He wants us. God wants us. He doesn't want our donations. He wants us. You know, there's a son who, who becomes religious and his parents are devastated. Their whole life is Yiddishkeit and for them it's the saddest thing in the world. He becomes very successful. So you know what he's doing? He's sending checks to his parents in the mail. I'm making money. His parents don't want his checks. They want him. They want him. They don't want his money. So Hashem also, it's a little bit different, of course, because our mitzvahs bring out our, our deepest essence. But Hashem doesn't just want our mitzvahs. He wants us. He wants us. He wants our hearts. He wants our minds. He wants every element of us. He wants a relationship with us absolutely and totally. Every fiber of our being and every bone in our body. That's what Hashem wants. Like marriage. You can't be 99% married. Either you're married or you're not married. It's very simple. The moment there's an impurity here, we're not dealing, there's something wrong here. Something wrong with the story. How could there be a, a place, how could there be room for impurity? The Rebbe used to say this a lot. The Rebbe said that anything which is not 100% true is 100% false. Think about it. Think about it. If it's 99% true, another way of saying that is that it's 100% false. Because truth is truth. Truth is not 99%. Truth is 100%. Truth is absolute truth. That's, what truth. that's the nature of truth. So it's the same thing. In the end of the day, impurity, being that purity or truth is absolute, is infinite, is God. Therefore, either it is or it isn't. Either it is or it isn't. Either it's being expressed or it's not being expressed. If there's any element of impurity here, we're not dealing with the real, with the real deal. The, or it's become contaminated and uh, you have to dig deeper. You need to purify yourself. You need to open yourself up to a, to a deeper truth. On the level of truth, there's no room for, for, for something which is not true. That's why there's no such thing. It's not, there's not one pasuk in the title which is not true. 
There's not one page of the Gemara which is not true. It's absolute truth. That's the nature. The Jews have been given the absolute truth of Hashem. A real tzaddik never sins. Never. Not once, a little bit in his brain, in the corner. No, no. No sins. No sins. A Rebbe, a real Rebbe. The, the, now, it doesn't mean if a person sins, it doesn't mean they're not a good person. It means they're not a Rebbe. It means they don't represent the truth. And in our own lives, we have to be aware of this, that if there's any part of our life which doesn't follow the code of Jewish law, it's not a detail. It means that as a person, as we've, in our revealed self, as a person, we haven't, we haven't accepted upon ourselves the yoke of heaven. We're not a... We're not a... Uh, we haven't... We haven't recognized the relationship that we're in, that we find ourselves in, that God has married us. Truly an absolute relationship. And so, so th that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, uh, the, more, the deeper lesson that's being taught here and being taught by, by Chagai and being taught by the Pasuk. And uh, I, was, I was planning to actually just spend a few minutes on this Gemara and then go to the next Gemara. Fascinating uh, and back to regular Agadita, if you will, regular in Yaakov. But we got into a tangent, and it's, it's uh, by divine providence. So we learned about an episode of Haggai, and, uh, the, uh, and essentially the two lessons that we took out of it, I hope, was a little bit of a, a, the lesson of, of, of the Shalah Kaddish, which is the ego, and that's what he was telling them, that they have to... And, and, uh, that they have to root out the ego because the ego is the source of sin, the Gemara says in Tainus. And when Jews sin, meaning they have things they're doing on the side, not following the Teda, then Hashem considers their sacrifices to be impure. And therefore, the, uh, therefore that's why the tzitz forgives for haughtiness for ego because the tzitz forgives for the sacrifices which are brought in impurity, which is one and the same thing. That we have to sacrifice ourselves. We have to open ourselves up rather to a deeper, our deeper self, to our relationship with God, egolessness. And then the second lesson uh, that we discussed was this interesting, fascinating concept in Judaism that impurity, by touching purity, makes it completely, ruins it, so to speak. It makes it impure. And the reverse is not true. You can't just touch holiness and, uh, and say that it makes you, uh, that it makes you holy. Um, once again, this share is b'schus and le'ilu nishmas. Avraham Shmuel ben Ayyelayb is the Shama should have a tremendous aliyah and we should have an aliyah with him in, in this world, of course. And um, I want to have a wonderful evening. Thank you, you too. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.